Well, Hi said that she wanted to have, what was it, airspace or, you know, <laughs> opportunity to talk, right? Lots of um, oxygen in the room. We got it. All right, so let's go back to the idea of schedule control and predictability, which is really gets at the crux of the matter for um, low-wage hourly workers. Um, so as Maureen's research will illustrate, the lack of control and knowing when workers will be scheduled play significant strain on the working families. This is where I left off when we got interrupted. So what we see here is that 38% of low-wage workers say that they have complete um, or uh, complete or a lot of control over the hours that they work on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is less in the goods producing and the service industry. And about 56% of workers state that they have control over breaks. That's right, I mentioned this. And about 33% of workers experience layoffs or reduction of work hours when work is slow. And I think this number may be slightly higher if we were to ask people if they experience weekly fluctuations in their schedule on a week-to-week -week basis. And then finally, about 76% of low-wage hourly workers are frequently asked to work um, over time with little or no notice. Um, we found in the city sales study, which is a, a large study of workers employed in a retail firm, that 51% of workers had um, only seven days or less notice um, of their schedule, and the rest had between seven and 14 days notice. So next I'd like to provide a few examples of flexible work arrangements for hourly workers. And these, and I'm sorry that you can't see it, and we'll make sure, and I try to put a few things on each slide. Um, <laughs> But um, these examples, and you'll get copies of them, are pulled from um, a study, a couple of studies. One that was conducted by um, WFD and Corporate Voices that look at kinds of promising pro practices of workplace flexibility, and also uh, the Center for Work and Family uh, at Boston College. So a few quick examples. One would be um, pre-planned or schedule, schedule modifications, having some kind of a flexible arrangement where there's the capacity for people to make um, schedule modifications, and this can be both in terms of what we call pre-planned schedule modifications that they can request to work or to not work a certain uh, schedule. And this can be done either on a regular basis or, as an example, that I can't work Monday nights. Um, another example would be kind of just-in-time um, schedule modifications. And what this allows is an employee to have some kind of mechanism whereby if an unpredictable, man, um, an unpredictable matter came up after the schedule was posted, that they can adjust their work hours without losing um, that particular shift. Um, another example is altern um, alternative work schedules within a manufacturing plant. I think we know that traditionally manufacturing plants have been very um, rigid and traditionally adhere to either a um, seven to three or three 24 hour, three eight hour shifts in a 24 hour period. Um, in this particular example, a manufacturing plant um, identified three different types of work shifts that employees could um, have preference into working. And if you want more detail, we can actually um, talk to um, Amy Richmond a little bit about this. Um, the next set of flexible um, work arrangements, excuse me, uh, workplace flexibility initiatives is time off. And um and as you can imagine, time off for, uh, for any of us is critical in terms of managing work and family. And it's particularly critical for low-wage workers. And what's um, important is that it's paid. Because as you can imagine, um, oftentimes low-wage hourly workers are one paycheck away from being able to uh, pay their mortgage or make rent. Here what we see is that 58% and only 36% of low-wage workers get paid sick time. And workers in goods producing and service um, ha have um, even less of this. Um, only 34% of full-time and 25% of part-time hourly workers are allowed to take uh, sick time without using their vacation time. And this number drops within the goods producing area, uh, good producing sector. Um, we also see that 77% of full-time workers receive paid vacation, but only 36% of part-time hourly workers receive any paid vacation. Um, and next slide. 
Okay, next slide. Thank you. And here are a few other examples of um, paid time off, again, taking from a couple of reports that were done by Corporate Voices and WFD, um, and also um, from some research that I've done with Jackie James at the Center on Work and Family related to the city sales study. Um, one is just in time, time off within the manufacturing um, sector. Traditionally, in manufacturing jobs, kind of the, uh, the model is, is that if you want to take time to go see a physician, to go to a child's event, you have to take a whole day off. And within this particular practice, what they were able to do is that employees could opt to take an hour or two off or part of a day. Um, HEB Grocery, which is located in Texas, has what they call the Med Bank, which gives employees um, who work, who give, um, lo it gives low wage hourly workers 40 hours of paid sick leave per year that they can use to either for their own personal illness or to um, take care of a, a child. And what they have found is actually that um, this has been good for business retention and recruitment and it has, had, it has helped to save them money. So the next question is, um, for the business people often is, is that we know flexibility is an imperative. But business people want to know what's the business case. Um, <clears throat> one side of the argument suggests that there is no business case for workplace flexibility. Um, that what the case is for is workforce flexibility. Uh, Henley and Lambert refer to this as employer-driven flexibility. And within the retail service sector, Lambert argues that hourly jobs are costs to be contained rather than an asset to be invested in. And schedule unpredictability is due to retail's tight link between labor costs and customer demands. Julia Henley and her colleagues found that retailers in their study selectively hire employees with the greatest availability, they post schedules with little or no notice, and they apply disciplinary action for such things as unplanned absences or showing up late. So from her perspective, businesses use workforce flexibility to contain costs and to meet their profit goals. So from this perspective, there is no business case. Now on the complete flip to that, Next slide. We see that um, within some companies they've identified, yes, there is. There is a business case for this. And this is a um, uh, kind of a back one slide. Mm -hmm. This is a, a summary of, um, of a variety of uh, interviews that were done with managers, both in the WFD Corporate Voices study and also with the City Sales study uh, that I was engaged in. And what we see from the manager's perspective is that there are um, the business cases for retention, recruitment, Productivity, it helps to reduce absenteeism. It can be a cost savings because it reduces overtime. It helps with customer service because um, employees are more engaged and it reduces absenteeism. But there are challenges. There's, there's challenges in terms of uh, an in inefficient use of managers' times, customer loyalty, and whether or not, um, yeah, and uh, I, I can't even read it. Um, <laughs> and sometimes it's difficult in terms of managing poor performance um, of some of the workers who might want flexibility. Um, and there are a variety of other benefits that um, WFD and Corporate Voices study has found around uh, the business case for workplace flexibility. On um, these next three slides that I'm going to show you, and I thank Amy in advance, um, we talked about these data. I used your slides to kind of illustrate this because I thought they were beautiful examples. So what these slides show is that workplace flexibility, having access to workplace flexibility is both good for uh, engagement, retention, and turnover. So in this slide, what we see is that workers with perceived flexibility have 50% higher engagement scores. Oh, no, this is employee stress. Mm -hmm. There we go. Mm -hmm. um, they have higher engagement scores. Um, can we go to the stress one? Sorry, I got um, Employees with perceived access to flexibility have 45% lower levels of stress compared to those without flexibility. And then the third one. And then finally, workers with perceived flexibility have a 30% lower turnover rate. Um, analyses conducted by families and work um, using the 2002 National Study of the Changing Workforce also demonstrate that flexibility is both good for businesses and good employees. We see that um, employees with greater access to flexibility report greater job satisfaction, stronger engagement, and less negative spillover. Likewise, it's good for um, employees. They have less negative spillover from work, greater life satisfaction, and they're, less, they're more likely to report uh, better uh, mental health outcomes. Thank <laughs> you.
Now, the last two slides that I'm going to um, share with you demonstrate the business um, case for, uh, for workplace flexibility, but they also demonstrate the complex uh, relationships between a variety of different dimensions of the work environment. These two slides are from the city sales studies, which I mentioned briefly, which is a large multi-method study of 6,000 workers employed in a Fortune 100 retail firm. Uh, we collected data uh, from employees in 388 stores in three regions of the country. Now, essentially, um, these, uh, this diagram is a path analysis that was turned on its side, and I removed some of the path as a way to kind of really demonstrate what, what, what are the main findings here. And this was created for the business audience as opposed to the academic audience. So if some of you academics out there who are thinking, that's not a path analysis, <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, I just kind of simplified it. Um, so what we see here is that uh, flexibility, and in this study, it turned out to be having um, whether or not people had input into their schedules and whether or not they had um, they were satisfied with their schedule and if they could uh, manage, if they could change their schedule when a work family matter came up. And what we see is that it's just one element of what, um, one element that predicts what businesses, especially in retail, are interested in, which is employee engagement. And what the research suggests is that um, high employee engagement scores uh, um, are highly correlated with positive outcomes that retailers are interested in. So you see here that other factors that matter are both um, job autonomy, whether the, the job is the right fit, do people have opportunities for development, and whether or not the supervisor is effective. Mm -hmm. So you see the direct relationship is with job fit, opportunities for development, and supervisor effectiveness to engagement. So we see that flexibility is indirectly related to what businesses are um, interested in. This next slide um, looks at outcomes for customer service. And I should say that these were um, objective data that we were able to uh, collect from the, from the stores. And what you see here is that the number one factor that matters most in uh, customer service at the store level is the supervisor's relationship with the employees. And you, you see what, what defines an effective supervisor are all these elements of which flexibility is one of them. So when, we, when I talked earlier about flexibility and it's important to have flexibility, specifically for these workers, it's important to have flexibility, but it's also important to think about the other aspects of the work environment. Because if we're trying to think about how to increase wages, one way is, is to um, provide the flexibility, but also opportunities for growth and development so people can um, increase their um, wages over time by climbing the corporate ladder, so to speak. Our last slide. So. Despite um, a fire alarm, <laughs> what we've learned is that many low-wage low hourly jobs are inherently inflexible. And I think many of us know that to a certain extent. And while the prevalence of flexible work arrangements and paid leave is embarrassingly low for this population, emerging research demonstrates prom promising results. There are companies out there that are doing it, and they're doing it well, and there is a business case for it. So, when employers either take the time to think about how these traditional structures and processes can be changed to meet the needs of the 21st century, both employees and employers win. So I th think that there's, when we think about our discussions for today, uh, from there are three areas that I think are important to note. One, from the research side, is that we need to refine our survey research measures to be able to adequately determine the prevalence of the type of workplace flexibility that's needed by low-wage workers in a variety of different industries and occupations. We also need to consider how low-wage jobs can be redesigned to provide more control and predictability of the number of hours worked and the timing of these hours. And then finally, paid leave is critical to success of all working families, in particular particularly for low-wage hourly workers. And I think we need to continue to push for uh, paid leave, uh, at, whether it's at the state level or the national level. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hey, okay, so I get five minutes because you had 40? No. no. 
I'm just kidding. I can't do anything in five minutes. Um, 25. First, I, I would like to thank Hi and Katie for inviting me to this really exciting, important conference. And I want to express my appreciation to the Sloan Foundation and Kathleen Christensen for really just supporting what is going to be a dialogue over the next two days. And I've heard that theme again and again and again. It's not just a bunch of people talking at us or with us, but that we really have conversations to try and get to some solutions, which is really exciting for me. But before I begin, I want to place, um, I guess I want to place myself in a context. Um, because as was noted in my intro, I'm an academic. Um, I'm in a psychology department of all places. I study work and family issues from the perspective, oh, there's one psychologist out there, um, from the perspective of the family. Um, I teach family psychology, I teach child development, so I'm very different than a lot of people in this room. My very brief foray into public policy in the state of Massachusetts, I was at the State House um, eight months ago at a sick leave meeting, and I sat there, and the first question asked me of a legislator was, so what's your bumper sticker? And I said, you're asking an academic who can't say anything in less than 30 minutes what my bumper sticker is? I, 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 so I want to get a bumper sticker by the end of this conference. That's my goal. Um, I also I collect a lot of data. I have a lot of statistics. I have a lot of path models. I had that, but, uh, and I believe in almost all of what I do. Um, but I also want to, almost all, the, some of those numbers you wonder about. Um, but I want to acknowledge at the outset that much of what I do, and I think much of what all of us do here, is based on some really core, deep-seated values. And values aren't right or wrong. They aren't good or bad, but they're there, and they really do guide what we fight about and what we fight for and what we believe in. And I think to just sort of lay that on the table in the beginning, what my values are um, and how they color what I do is really important to put out there because values are something that I think we have to be in this discussion of, of low-wage workers. So I think my values are most clearly described in the um, in the words of Martin Luther King, who said when talking to the striking sanitation workers back in 1968, you probably all know this, so often we overlook the worth and significance of those who are not in professional jobs, or those who are not in the so-called big jobs. But let me say to you tonight that whenever you're engaged in work that serves humanity and is for the building of humanity, it has dignity and it has worth. And one day our society must come to see this. One day our society will come to respect the sanitation worker if it is to survive. For the person who picks up our garbage in the final analysis is as significant as the physician. All labor has worth. And I believe all work should have value and be valued. And these beliefs are going to underlie my comments today. But I also recognize, actually my husband made me add this line because when I was practicing with him he said, you're going to lose a lot of people if you start just that way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I recognize that for companies to stay in business and for workers to thrive, we do have to worry about cost, we do have to worry about profits, and that's why we're all here today, to try and have both of those conversations at the same time, because I do believe probably everybody would agree with those statements by Martin Luther King. How do we make it happen? So now on to the details. So I was asked to highlight the unique, need, unique needs of workers at lower levels of the socioeconomic strata, hourly low-wage workers. And my other task is to link the needs of those workers to the goals of workplace Flexibility 2010, and hopefully to help set the stage for the conversations we're going to have over the next two days um, about these issues. And I just want to say I'm very excited about bringing the voices of low-wage workers to the table, and I really hope I can do them justice here. So, go on. So we all know that work family policies designed as one size fits all fail to benefit all employees equally. And at times they can even have unintended negative effects, which I'm going to talk about um, a little later. Um, and many have argued that there's a serious mismatch between today's workforce and the public policies or, la or lack thereof that we have to support them. And to understand that mismatch, we really need to look at the jobs that people are doing, who's doing those jobs, and where the match is not working. So I'm just going to briefly highlight some of these jobs because Jennifer already did this. Um, but basically there are three main occupational areas. Um, there's service occupations, sales and office occupations, and production transportation and material moving. And it's clear if you even look at within those kinds of jobs, which I'll share with you in a minute in some of our data, the issues um, related to work hours, schedules, flexibility, leave benefits would really look quite different even across these kinds of jobs. So for example, retail sales workers' job characteristics would call for very different interventions than truck drivers, for example. 
So a primary aim of my comments today is to focus on how the distinct characteristics of different types of low-wage employment create really unique ecological niches for us to then think about what would be the appropriate work-family interventions. And I think it's really, I'm going to primarily be talking about workers and work families and what they're saying to me about this, but we have to consider and keep considering the employer perspective on this. Um, and again, I might be a little jaded on this topic. I'm hoping to move from that over the next two days. But Susan Lambert, who studies hourly workers from the perspective of the employer and the workplace, highlights some key differences in employers' views of professional and hourly workers. So Professor Lambert points out the distinction in the language used to talk about workers at different ends of the class continuum. So for example, terms like recruiting and retaining talent are most common when human resource managers are hiring salaried or professional workers. As compared to the language that Jennifer just talked about of cost containment that's most often linked to hourly jobs. Susan highlights the fact that many of today's jobs are designed to keep costs flexible, to sort of move with the market in order to contain, if not minimize labor costs. Thus, a major goal of managing low-wage work is to match work hours to times of greatest consumer demand, which often leads to variable work hours, variable work schedules, and a lot of job instability. For example, in many low-level jobs, the idea of, like, do you work full-time or do you work part-time, which we ask some of our participants, is really only loosely related to the actual hours that they do in their job. Workers can be kept on the payroll when they actually make no money and are working no hours for weeks and even months at a time. And in our own research with working parents, it's not unusual for workers in the course of a year's time to move from employment to underemployment, less than 20 hours, to overemployment, more than 60 hours, to unemployment, all within one year's time, which in their in a very pragmatic level, just wreaks havoc in any family's life. As a researcher, how the heck do you measure something like the average work week or the typical work schedule when there is not such a thing? Um, so those are the struggles um, we all face in sort of thinking about these issues. So now I'd like to turn to some of our, um, sort of tell you where these stories are coming from. And I want to share with you data that we've been collecting now for the past 10 years in the Work and Family Transitions Project. And I'm happy to give you lots more detail about this at another time. But we've been studying the transition to parenthood for over 300 low-wage workers, both two-parent and single-mother families, with the primary aim of our study looking at how work conditions and workplace policies affect not only parents' well-being, mental health, relationship quality, but then how that translates into affecting their children's development. Um, so our f project focuses primarily on working class employees, meaning that the majority of our sample um, are high school educated. We've got the highest degree they could have was an associate's degree, which is about 18% of the sample. They make an average of $24,000 a year in their job. Thus, they are not officially poor, but they're teetering on the edge of poverty at any one time. And now due to the staggered recruitment into the study that we've been doing now for about 10 years, we've got some families who are just having their babies, and we've got families who their first child is now entering the first grade. So we have a fairly good picture of the kinds of issues that happen very early on and then how it happens in the very early, early years of parenthood when you're trying to hold down two jobs, in the case of two parent families, or one job for single moms and at the same time raise very young children. So. So I'm going to, I was asked to primarily talk about flexibility, since that's the focus of the conference. But of course, when Hi first asked me, I said, what? I, th that flexibility, they don't even know what, that doesn't matter. The, the issue is they need full-time work. She said, OK, you can say that, but then talk about flexibility. So, <laughs> so I get to have this one slide where I say my piece. Um, I feel compelled to note that a common frustration experienced by many of our participants is the inability to secure full-time work. Workers might be on the payroll, but their hours vary from week to week, from zero to 60 plus with virtually no warning. So think about this, trying to plan childcare from week to week, trying to figure out what bills you're going to be able to pay that week, trying to figure out like a, a family meal it gets virtually impossible when each week, four days ahead of time, you're finding out what your schedule is. We have numerous examples of employees not being allowed to work over 30 hours, even when employers are short staffed. Moreover, seasonal jobs, which make up about 20% of the occupations in our sample, contribute to great instability in hour and wages over the course of a whole year. So again, this idea of an average income over a year, an average work week just doesn't work for seasonal workers. So when I ask workers, we actually in our, in our study asked workers about flexibility they have at their job. Um, that, it doesn't make a lot of sense. They don't quite know what I mean when I say flexibility. And I've gotten much better using a lot of the data from people in this room how to ask about flexibility, but we usually end up with a lot of zeros in our data because it's not there. 
And this instability of employment wreaks havoc in the lives of employees and their families. So just to give you sort of one picture, at the most basic level, the inability to rely on a set weekly or monthly income has led about 25% of our families to move residences at least once, um, this, and this is in their first year of having a baby, often numerous times across one year. So the moving residences, when you think about what that, how that plays out for kids and families, leads to changes in child care plans, leads to changes in school situations for our children, families with older children, um, greater reliance on extended family and kin. You, you use up a lot of your social support network when this system sort of gets into place. And moreover, the lack of a permanent address in phone makes it difficult to apply for jobs because you don't have that information that you needed to give them. And what we've seen in our employees is extreme frustration about the lack of control in this situation. And that control then translates that lack of control to higher levels of depression, higher levels of role overload, which then translate into parental stress, less effective parenting, and outcomes for our children. So before turning to the more quantitative data and descriptive data, I want to give you, um, share two stories that just highlight multiple ways that, that challenges around flexibility occur in the lives of working families. I want to introduce Colleen and Jacob. Uh, when I met Colleen, she was 23, and she worked for a package delivery company, and Jacob was 24, and he worked as a janitor at a small college. They'd been married for one year and were expecting their first baby when I first met them. Both work full-time. Their combined gross family income is $34,280. They both make around $9 an hour. And after taxes, they bring home about $28,000. Colleen took six weeks off. That was all she could afford to take off um, when her baby was born. So she used up all her vacation time, her personal time, and her sick time. And then she got ready to go back to work. And the two days before she went back to work, she got a call from her supervisor saying, by the way, I just wanted to let you know your 7 to 3 shift, which is the shift she had always had, which is the shift she was planning on going back to, just got switched to 11 to 7. So show up in two days at 11. She had already planned her child care for 7 to 3. And just thinking about getting child care for 11 to 7 already raises all sorts of red flags in your head as well. She called me. Um, asking me if this was legal, and a legal scholar, and I said, whoa, that's horrible, and, and actually, get, schedule is not guaranteed when you return. The job is guaranteed, but the schedule is not guaranteed, so I had to tell her it was legal. Um, now, the other story about Colleen, and Colleen is a real um, uh, sort of fighter. She actually said, if I, if I be in your study, can I go to Oprah and tell her my story? And I said, you can go to Oprah anytime you want. But she um, wanted to go back. She had decided that she wanted to be able to nurse her baby, that the way she was going to stay connected to her baby, even though she had to go back to work, was pump her milk and stay connected to her baby and bonded to her baby. And she was adamant about this. So when she went back to work, she asked her supervisor if it would be possible for her to take her truck back to the main office, pump her milk, and then she would work whatever extra hours were needed if it took too much time. And she was denied that request. So she ended up sitting in the back of her truck um, in February pumping her milk and for a year she breastfed her baby um, and pumped her milk. Um, but talk about flexibility or lack of flexibility, there's a place, not a huge imposition that could have made a huge difference for her in her life. And finally, the last point I want to make about Colleen is she took, as I mentioned, all her vacation, all her sick, all her personal time to have paid leave for her baby. Um, and then she went back to work. And all of you who have had young kids know what happens when you go back to work when you have a baby, they get sick. She had no safety net. Her husband took some of his time, but in the final analysis across the first year, she'd already been written up three times. Times, um, for insubordination because she would not go to work when her child was sick. I also want you to consider the story of Janessa, who worked for a communication company, and what she described to me is her perfect job, selling communication systems over the phone. I was, could not believe this was her perfect job, but she loved this job, and she was really good at it. She held down the job for two months, um, but would not be permanent until she had a good work record for 20 weeks. So when I met her again, she was pregnant. She had a long-term boyfriend. They wanted to marry but couldn't afford to yet. She took a four-week unpaid parental leave um, but didn't have any sick or vacation time to use because she hadn't accrued that yet. Um, and a month after she returned to work, her baby became ill. Her boyfriend had already left for Army boot camp. Uh, she didn't have an extended support network, so not knowing what else to do, she stayed home with her baby. Uh, she went to work the next day and was immediately fired and again called me and said, is this legal? And I said... Um, I'm not sure, but when we actually checked in, the waiting period on her job was 20 weeks, and during that time, um, she had no policies to fall back on. 
Now, these stories are not unique, but I think they highlight a number of the themes that I want to sort of just go through here about what are the key issues for low-wage workers. But I also want to say as a caveat, not all low-wage workers and not all of the families we interviewed are miserable and downtrodden and hate their jobs. Um, and I think we can learn a lot from those who actually love their work, get energized by their work. And a lot of the data out there that does big national surveys, which is compares averages for high-wage and low-wage workers, groups low-wage work into that sort of stereotype that everybody is miserable and sad and unhappy. There actually are great examples of it working, and I think those might also be clues for us to what about those jobs can actually make a difference for families. So um, in our study, as I mentioned, we interviewed our families five times across the first year of parenthood, and then we've gone back when their child, children are turning six years old. I'm not going to present. I have a lot of data on mental health. I have a lot of data on child outcomes and work conditions. I'm going to present more of the, the sort of qualitative pieces here, but I'm happy to give you references or talk about it at another time um, t in the conf during the conference. But I want to start with that, the question we asked, which was really this kind of open-ended. The study was about work and family. We might as well ask them. Uh, what are the struggles and the demands that, that face? And their answers, no big surprise, is probably every person in this room would say this, time and money. Um, and time was really around all kinds of time. time. Work scheduling time, flexibility time, time with my baby, time with my partner, time for myself. Um, all of those issues and the amount of frustration with the lack of that. So what about time? When we really got into this with them, what about time really matters? So the first problem, and Jennifer already alluded to this, is being unable to plan your work schedule. So if you only find out four days ahead of time what your schedule is for the next week, we literally had moms in, in our study who on their refrigerator, the minute they got their schedule, called all their child care providers and get different people to kick in, especially over that first year of life. Many did not want to use formal daycare. They wanted to use family. So children were with grandma one day and uncle the other day and my sister another day. Um, so the question of whether that creates a very flexible child or creates problems, we have to answer. Um, moreover, the number of hours and the timing of those hours change weekly to accommodate needs in the service sector. So around holiday times, Christmas, Hanukkah, there was, uh, you know, huge, you'd be working 60 hours a week, and then in January, all of a sudden, you're down to 10. So sort of that change was really hard to take in terms of paying bills. So my question, you know, as a psychologist, um, we tell our families, you know, when we, you know, what the spouse's structure and family meals and bedtime and, you know, keeping things organized and letting kids know there's a plan. And we've got work situations that are making it very difficult to do that. We do set up this struggle daily, weekly for families to sort of do what they know they want to do, but also trying to keep their, their work going. So how do you manage that? Uh, and again, the challenges of shift work, um, I've done a lot of work in our sample on shift work because over a third of our sample does shift work, and it's a really double-edged sword. A lot of our families like shift work because dad can work 7 to 3, mom can work 3 to 11, they don't have to hire care, and there can be sole parental care, which is a huge value for them. However, if you look at the data on relationship quality, marital conflict, marital instability, um, it's a real risk factor for marriages. And you're looking at marriages at a very risky time already. Ready, um, and a high stress time and then there's no time for couples to be together it creates some challenges the other issue about shift work is finding child care from a three for a three to eleven shift or eleven to seven shift is just sometimes insurmountable okay predictability of overtime for, again another double-edged sword many of our families live relying on their overtime. They need the overtime. It's part of their budget. They plan in overtime. However, the unpredictability of it is really, really hard to manage. Now, mandatory overtime is the hours above the standard work week that employer makes compulsory with a threat of job loss or other reprisals such as demotions, assignments to unattractive work, shifts or tasks, or loss of pay. Um, so when I actually first heard this description, when one of my um, uh, participants was telling me about mandatory overtime, I said, is that legal? Because I, I, I had never heard of mandatory overtime. Um, and it absolutely is. And, and their point was, don't take away my overtime, but I'd like to know if there's a way I could figure out when it's going to happen. Because what would happen is you'd get into work at 7 in the morning and be told, you need to stay till 5 tonight, or you need to stay till 7 tonight. Your child care ends at 3 you're stuck. Um, and there are some creative ways that some people in our sample have actually come up with um, saying this will be the week you get it. If there's overtime, this is your week for overtime, so you can sort of plan ahead, and I can share some of those ideas with you later. 
sick time. Personal time has replaced sick time for most of our participants, which as a, you know, a naive professional woman, I thought personal time's great because you have flexibility, you can use, you know, don't use all your sick time anyway, you can use your personal time. The problem with personal time is you have to plan it. So when our moms would call thinking they could use their personal time to take care of their sick baby, they'd say, no, you didn't plan it. You need to come in. So it really creates um, a huge problem. Um, so we actually now are legislating, I know it's happening all over the place, I think it just happened in California, to get sick time, which actually was a policy in Massachusetts in the 70s, back on the books because personal time um, isn't cutting it. Um, second, flexibility in the scheduling of workday breaks. The example of Colleen, just being able to say where you take your break and, and what would be useful time to take your break, and maybe not only taking your break at 10 o'clock, but being able to sort of or put two breaks together, or some way having some control um, over that break time so she could um, pump her milk at a place where it was more convenient. The ability to check in on children. I'm sure many of you have heard of sort of the 3 o'clock syndrome, where at 3 o'clock all the employees get on the phone to see if their child got home, and, you know, Ellen's written about this, is everybody okay, and that check-in time. Uh, some companies actually just allow a 10 minute break right around then so you can call and just check in and make sure things are okay. It, it doesn't address the whole issue of the three to six unsupervised time, which is another conversation we probably need to have as well, but it would help. Um, I also think this idea of benefit waiting periods is hugely problematic because the families in our project are very young, many of them in their first or second jobs. Um, so they're dealing with trying to be top performer for one month or up to six months, so they're not fired, but they're doing that in, at the same time as having an infant at home, which, you know, how many of you were top performers when you had babies at home? Surely not me. So thinking about that mismatch is a huge issue. And I need to address, because given the, our sample, um, and I'm not going to talk a lot about lo older workers here, but I have a whole spiel I could talk about with them, but I'm, because our sample was primarily with low, uh, with transition to parenthood, I want to talk about family leave. Um, and so the next slide shows from our data who used what kind of leave. So the two big blue chunks, the unpaid personal sick time, 44% of our sample had unpaid personal sick time that they used. Oh, the average leave in our sample was 10 weeks, by the way. Um, paid personal sick time, when we first asked, and we asked it the wrong way, um, did you get paid parental leave, about 25% of the sample said yes. And we said, wow, really? 25% of you had paid leave? When we actually went further and asked about that, they considered it paid leave if they used all their sick and personal vacation time as they're paid. Now we know better to ask, you know, paid leave that wasn't using your personal vacation and found out that basically 7% of them had some paid parental leave. The average was three weeks. 18% um, used their paid personal sick or vacation time for their leave. The other big category, which I think deserves some discussion at some point in the next couple of days, is the other category. We had 11% of moms in this other category, and what they did was just quit their job when the baby was about to come, and then they just find another job after. So there was like sort of no connection to their work. There was no sense of, of well, you know, I work at Burger King. I can get a job at McDonald's. It's not a big deal. I'll just sort of move in and move out. And it was just easier than having to even talk to their boss and tell them what they wanted or what they needed. And I think there's another place for some discussion because that costs everybody. That costs the employee and it costs the employer. No matter what kind of job, just turnover is a tough thing for anybody to deal with. So paid parental leave, um, I want to argue, is one of those benefits that really benefits people at the higher level of the, of the social strata, but um, does a disservice to those at the lower levels. Uh, and for example, in my own institution, faculty at my institution receive a semester off of paid leave when they have a baby or an adoption, um, but our secretarial staff and um, salary, uh, non-salaried workers receive 12 weeks unpaid leave which you know, led my secretary to say, so you know, is my baby really less important than a faculty member's baby? And that's when a policy can do harm, I think. Finally, part-time work with benefits. Many of our families with infants would have preferred part-time work, but they needed to work full-time to get benefits. Um, and the question of whether there could be some, and actually, and then when we get follow them as their child entering the first grade, they all want full-time work again. So if there's some way of thinking about flexibility even in those first early years to just give people some breathing room. They do actually do want to go back full time but the benefits is the key issue. When you lose that, you can't afford to lose that so they have to go back. I want to just put up this slide because I ultimately am interested in the implications for children and I think it's a big argument we all have to make in this discussion. 
Our data have revealed that poor work conditions, like unpredictable work, unpredictable schedules, uh, poor leave policies over time, are all related to parents' mental health. When those things are bad, depression increases, anxiety increases, overload increases, and in particular, parenting stress. We have a particular measure of PSI, which is called the Parenting Stress Index, which as work gets tougher, Parenting Stress Index goes up, and the Parenting Stress Index is directly and significantly related to kid outcomes like socio-emotional development, cognitive development. So that, to me, is the greatest cost to our society and the greatest cost to our families, not being able to parent their kids the way they want to and having kids bear the brunt of some of these policies. And I actually believe some of the solutions for employers and families are the same. Stability is really the key. If we can figure out ways to have these policies, oh, okay, my time's up. Stability, that would be um, the critical point. So last slide. So the employer has a critical role, and I have been called naive, and I've been called a do-gooder and a um, bleeding heart and all those sorts of things. Um, but in reality, I think most employers, when they talk about work, say the same kinds of things. The challenge comes in remembering like what we have to do to value work. We value work, but what do we have to do to make it appear valuable? And I don't think cost containment and profit margins can be denied. But as Nancy Fulbright um, said, who's an economist and wrote a book called The Invisible Heart about a caring society, she said, every society must confront the, confront the problem of balancing self-interested pursuits with the care of others, including children, the elderly, and the infirmed. So I want to just end saying we're here today to consider solutions to support working families, and I challenge all of us to be thinking about um, our mutual responsibilities in this discussion, and I really hope that we can be a society known more for our sense of caring um, for others and for kids than a society focused on cost containment and profit margins. Thank you. Thank you. So here's what we're going to do um, in terms of timing. I'm going to invite Arlene Johnson up to give a response from a sort of business practice um, perspective. And you've heard several times, um, especially, well, you've heard in Jennifer's presentation, the um, report um, from WFD and Corporate Voices on um, low-income, low-wage workers that Amy Richmond and Jan Sivian, both of whom are in the audience here today, worked on with Arlene. Um, and so we will have Arlene give a... Um, um, some response comments. Then we will take a 10 minute break and we will come back and hear the policy uh, comments response and that will flow into the conversation with all of the rest of us. So, Arlene. I first have to echo thanks to the Sloan Foundation and Workforce 2000, or Workplace 2010 for making possible this unique experience and this cross-disciplinary conversation. So thank you very much. And then I have to, secondly, um, plead for some sympathy for the difficulty of the task that we've been given. Not only have the speakers pretty much said it all, but we were instructed as respondents to be candid really dangerous, um, spontaneous, tremendously dangerous, and brief. And I, you know, I have so many notes stimulated by these great uh, presentations that being brief is hard. But I know it's important because the best part of the conversation will be hearing from you all, and we certainly want to leave time for that. So first, um, first reaction is the need to say something that's obvious but must be said, and that is speaking of an employer response, we know that's not a monolith, that employers and business range from the meatpacking industry that gets raided for abuse of low-income workers to a Marriott and many others that we could name that have led the charge to get us focused on the issue of low-income workers and to take leadership. And so there's and everything in between. And I would be very disingenuous if I tried to speak for all of those folks. So instead, I will speak from what I am, which is a consultant who's worked with hundreds of organizations and talked to them about flexibility and react, thinking of what I would, I think some of them would feel or think were they here in the room with us today, and knowing there'll be a great variety. One thing that 
I'm sure would bubble up being human beings is, is business being credited sufficiently for all that is done to focus on this issue? It occurred to me in a new way as I was listening to good examples that, you know, it wasn't, though we are brilliant, um, consultants like me or others who have invented the solutions, all these creative solutions, where have they come from? They've come from workplaces and from solving problems. And now, um, as our speaker said, there are, if you list all the different permutations and combinations of types of flexibilities, they are in the scores now from the creativity in certain workplaces. I want to thank both speakers for talking about fit and context that flexibility is not an absolute. It's not a construct or a definition or a formula that you bring and plop down on the workplace. But it is so shaped by context. And if anything, I'd want to say that more. You both said it, but it needs to be said more, that it's different for different jobs, for different industries. And that's... Um, Thank you, Jennifer, for pointing out that that's a problem with vocabulary um, and stumble. We don't want to turn this into a semantic discussion, but flexibility is heard in so many different ways. Most often, I think it's heard as arrangements, flexible arrangements. And so I love the idea of moving to understanding it in terms of work environment or dimensions of control and autonomy and support um, or a great new thought that you brought to me, Jennifer, was to think of this in terms of effective supervision. What if we didn't even say, well, could we start focusing on how to be more effective in supervising today's workforce? And flexibility would pop right to the top and without having to advocate for it. Um, so coming from that, I'm always going to be checking my watch here, uh, coming from that, mm -hmm. A question bubbled up again, again wearing my business practitioner hat. Do they understand me? <laughs> you know, the perennial question. Do they? Un it's, it's the perennial question of any conversation. And that's what we're having here, a conversation. That, um, and this is no criticism of the speakers, because I know they're under the same constraints as we all are of time and how much you can cover. Um, but giving credit to the need for profit, for cost containment, I'm sure it's genuine, but do they know how hard it is to make a profit today? How hard it is to keep people in the workplace? Do they understand that my profit margin is so little that I have hardly any degrees of freedom or that I feel that I don't? Do they know about the job market I'm working in? Do they understand the competition? And do they realize what poor supervisors I have and that they're asking me to do something? You know, so I think this, this, um, this will sound defensive, but it isn't defensive. It's sort of what you have to do in every conversation. That, I mean, we've had it with our spouses, with our children. Unless they feel heard and understood, you can't have the next sentence. And I think very, so we as researchers, and I put that myself in that category right now, have to be very careful about where we say the problem is. Um, and be careful that we haven't portrayed people who see themselves as very caring managers but have a tough job that we not have accidentally portrayed them as a problem because they are part of the solution. Um, then another question arose that I think has some opportunities for uh, research further and that is the question, um, should I care? And why should I care? Now that may seem like a callous question but in terms of resource management, you put your attention on those resources that are most important to your endeavor. Talent management is all. It's the word today. It's, um, and it's the reason that the secretary may not get the paid leave, but the professor does, because it's clear to the endeavor 
that the professor is critical. It's not always as clear that the, that the secretary is also irreplaceable and an absolutely essential part. Now, more and more companies are realizing this. And again, I point to Marriott, who for years has realized that their customer satisfaction depends less on the executives than it does on the housekeeping staff. <laughs> and banks have started to realize this, that your image is the teller, not the executive. But more has to be done to to explain how the lower income worker is critical to the endeavor because otherwise we're talking about social work rather than business which and social work is good but it's not my job as a business person um, this leads to I think a perennial question of data you know and, and what do what does business need in order to move forward well first of all <laughs> Business, the threshold for meaningful data is far lower than you think it is. Um, very, no company has ever asked me for um, a clarification of standard deviation. <laughs> and it is impactful to know that uh, flexibility or control, let's call it control and autonomy and good supervision, results in better engagement, retention, and so forth. Those things matter. But in the data collection, what I would love to do in our conversation today is to stretch the storyline. Because the storyline, as we're starting to tell it, and as it's often told, starts with the employee problem, how could it be a solution, and then, by the way, there's benefit to business. Could we stretch the, to say, here are the employee and the business issues. Here is how we could address both in collaboration, and then these are the results. So that the business outcome is not an afterthought after we've advocated for flexibility. Um, the stories really help see the issues, and thank you so much for the stories. And there too, Maureen, you know, there's an opportunity to stretch the storyline to say, how could Colleen have solved that problem? What was the problem the employer was having that made for the inflexibility? And um, to link it to performance issues, so often flexibility is offered as a result of uh, or as payment for good performance when we know that it's often flexibility that creates good performance. So stretching that storyline um, from not only moral outrage, social outrage, um, demographic crisis, to economic outrage and crisis. We have a, an economy and a workplace that is not fitting. Why is that a business problem? And get that at the front end. Um, I've used my time, so let me just say that I think the questions are so human and so predictable in terms of having this conversation. It's, do you understand me? Do you realize how tough my life is? Do you see me as the solution, as the target, or do you see me as a collaborator and a partner and as a true stakeholder? Mm -hmm. I have other brilliant thoughts here. <laughs> but I'm going to make uh, leave plenty of time for us all to be brilliant together. Thank you very much. Um, two things. Number one, if you go onto the Corporate Voices website, you will be able to download the report um, that WFD did um, as a subcontract to Corporate Voices. And I want to mention again Amy Richmond and Jan Sevian's names since they were very active um, in doing that work. And when I asked Arlene to be the commentator, she said, well, no, really, you know, the person who did the data was Amy and Jan. And I said, no, no, I know that, but I'm not asking you to comment with more data. I'm asking you to comment from your perspective and your wisdom. You know, what does this sound like to you when you hear this? So I want to thank you for that. I want to mention Amy and Jan's names and tell you that you should download that report. Um, and we're going to take a 10-minute break while Susan and Peter get 
time to make their brilliant comments, and then it's going to be an open conversation with all of us. So we will reconvene here in 10 minutes. That was great off the cuff. Holy cow. Why are you I think you're absolutely right, though. You know, when, when you point and which I should have given an example of. Get your last uh, water.